society. And why is science treated that way? I mean, you and I both went to MIT, and when yeah. we were kids, I don't know about you, but I was the science geek. I was mm -hmm. the science fair. Sure. I was programming computers, yeah. which yeah. meant I didn't do music and I didn't do sports. And then, I mean, even at MIT, there's not a lot of other things to do there besides science. Yeah. And well, you overcame that. You clearly done sports. Yeah, sense. that's but, true. <laughs> but you know. Why well, is it kind well, of pushed I think over here? The, I mean, there's lo look, I'm not the first one to think about this either. Right? There's lots of scientists are responsible for part of this. The, the, it, having keeping it a club, making it seem like only certain people can understand things, make, gives you a kind of power. Right. Which was the history of science. Yeah, yeah, and 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 scientists could do that, and partly physicists are the worst uh, are the worst of the lot in a sense because they 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 held the key to the atomic bomb, right? The Manhattan Project, and that meant huge government government dollars going into physics research because physicists could produce things like bombs. And so um, you, could, you could just t keep feeding from the trough without making any attempt to, to explain what you're doing. Eventually that stopped, you know, that, and, and physicists began to realize in order to get funding for large projects, we actually have to explain why we're doing what we're doing. So I think scientists are part of the problem, but I think, I think our, our our intellectual evolution, at least in the United States, is part of the problem. I taught at Yale for a long time, and Yale, I like, I like to think of as a glorified liberal arts college when I was there. I mean, there's great science that's being done there, but I can tell you that most students were proud that they never went up to Science Hill or took a class or had to waste their time from, you know, moving away from English or literature or history to, to dirty their hands in science. Much more also that they just didn't you know, they, they, they just couldn't do it, right? And of course they could do it, okay? But the notion came that you could be an intellectual and an educated person, and, and it's okay if you just couldn't do science. In fact, it's almost a badge of honor to be an intellectual, say, well, my brain doesn't work that way. I'm no good at math. Yeah, and of course, all those students at Yale could have, uh, for a while, we tried to introduce where oh, they all had to take calculus, and, there, and eventually it didn't happen because the math department didn't want to teach it, but, but all those students could do it, okay? But it was a badge of honor to say, well, you know, my mind doesn't work that way, I'm artistic. That's a recent development. It didn't used to be that way, you know, 100 years ago, um, where to be an educated gentleman in England, or say, you know, maybe 150 years ago, you used to have to at least have a cocktail party knowledge of, of, of science, okay? You also maybe had to know Latin and Greek, other things that have gone by the wayside. But, but the, I think for me, as much as, the, as, as, as we bemoan the teaching of science in schools, which is a real problem, I also view that the intellectual elites are part of the problem because even those people who are interested in ideas somehow can think that, they can, that, that being scientifically illiterate doesn't make you illiterate. But in a modern world, it should. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and we teach science, that we also teach science. We, 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 move, we push people away from science early on. In the United States, in the middle school level, uh, back when I last looked at this, which is again a decade or so when I was writing about it, well over 80 to 90% of middle school science teachers had no background in science. They were teaching science. What did that mean? That meant they were uncomfortable teaching. And I saw it when my daughter was young. Even in grade two or three, when she'd go in and, and you know, what are you learning in science? Well, it's bright during the day and dark at night, you know what I mean? But her science teacher, her teacher when she was doing science, I could see that she felt uncomfortable doing that. What message does that send, send to the little kids? Okay, but then we also, um, all, I think a big part of the problem is, um, and, and we've tried to change that in various school systems, is the order of teaching science. In high schools, you tend to teach biology first, then chemistry, then physics. And since it's now all electives, it means people never get to physics, a lot of them, okay? Why do they do that? And part of the argument is that biology is, is natural. It's easier to people to picture. It's living systems. It's something you more feel com more comfortable with. There's less math. But the problem is that what it means is, and this is the reason I probably didn't become a doctor, because biology was taught when I was going to high school, dissecting a frog and memorizing the parts of a frog. It means rote memorization. The problem is, what's at the root of biology? It's chemistry. What's at the root of chemistry? It's physics. So if you, instead of taking the right order, 
learning some physics, learning about energy, which then becomes important for chemistry, which then becomes important. Well, you understand these are processes. They're not things you memorize and say, yeah, someone told me this is the way it is, but I can understand how it is the way it is. You don't get that because you've learned it ass backwards. And so I think we need to understand that, that you know, we need to th teach people the scientific process, not the results of science, but the process of skeptical inquiry, testing, retesting, uh, all of those things that, that, that make science worthwhile are vitally important for the public to make them responsible adults in a, in a, in a pseudo-democratic society. Yeah, and when the misinformation society and the too much information society, which didn't exist 20 years ago. Yeah, so it produces this incredible challenge. You have right. people who are, were, who, many of whom are not trained to deal with, with the situation before that and are, are therefore open prey to a misinformation society right now. We, and, and I don't want to sound like, again, like a, we're all prey to it. We all are subject to nonsense and we all have biases and beliefs that are ridiculous. But what we have to do is to be trained to question, to question the question. Yeah, yeah. the scientific method has, has served me well. And sometimes I'll bump into people that just didn't have a training with it. I mean, honestly, a based in science fair project yeah. is, is, is enough to get you the scientific method. I have a problem, I have a hypothesis, I run my tests and I find out what the solution is not necessarily what my hypothesis was, that's okay. That's great. And then we give the, the truth yeah. and then we try to come up with a conclusion. Like, yeah. that's like something if, like- If that's what you get out of a science fair project, it's great. I'm too worried often nowadays, <laughs> so many parents are involved in science school practices. What you try and get is pretty pictures and pretty. Yeah, but if true. you can get that, but that's you know, what I remember as a kid, and yeah. it, it, it's it also seems so basic, but I guess it wasn't basic. Well, I think it it should be, and it's all. I mean, it's also fun. Although yeah. one of my crew was just reminding me that one of our events, Richard Richard Dawkins said, "Fun is overrated," but <laughs> <laughs> which is so took off for Richard. But what I mean is, it's not it's not as if science is just fun. It's also hard work, but it is fun. The aha experience that you've had, and everyone's had at some point in their life is. It's orgasmic. It is thrilling to discover that the world behaves differently than you thought, or to understand something basic behind something that you never questioned. You know, why do planes fly? Why is the sky blue? And so, that primal enjoyment is something we need to we need to enforce more. And and uh, you know, there's a realization I had, which I should have had years before. I was I, w I had just done a science movie, and I was uh, you know in a movie. It's a wonderful movie called The Farthest. I was just one of the talking heads in it about the Voyager. Program. Yeah, it was produced by a wonderful Irish director, in fact. And um, the opening was in Ireland, and I was there. And I was talking to a young person, and it suddenly hit me. Again, maybe this is obvious to everyone, but to me it wasn't until that moment, that we should realize that every time a young person learns something new, for them it's the first time in the history of the world that's been understood. It's not repeating what's already known, it's discovery. The act of learning is discovery, and gosh, we should be teaching that. We should make people feel, realize, and appreciate that they are discovering the world. They're not rediscovering the world. They are discovering it because it's the first mm -hmm. time for them. And that act, I do think we're hardwired. We're hardwired to solve puzzles. Uh, there's lots of positive things as well as the negative things we're hardwired to do. It's pleasing for people to solve puzzles. Uh, to, uh, again, you cannot, the evolutionary basis for that is kind of obvious. And so let's play off the things that really are gratifying as well as, 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 well as trying to avoid the things that aren't. And, and so whether you call it science or not, and that's why I wrote The Physics of Star Trek the first time maybe, a lot of people are interested in science. It's just they don't know what science they're interested in. So if, if I, as I used to say years ago, when I, if I went to a party and I was, you know, people asked me what I did, I'd say, you know, I'm a physicist. And they go, well, how about those Yankees, you know? And then... But if you talk about time travel or warp drive or something that doesn't intimidate people, and then there are lots of questions, and that's why black holes are so great because everyone, you know, it's a great sexy term. Then people realize don't, they don't realize that those are scientific questions, and it's interesting them. And you can have a discussion, and people ask lots of questions. And so, labeling something as science sometimes is another way of turning people off. Yeah, and 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 that's why. That's why I, tr you know, I try to get involved in, in movies and other things because I, there should be a continuity of intellectual discovery and enjoyment. And science is just one part of it, as is music and art. And